And this is Professor Hamamoto. It is December 2nd, year 2021, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And very quickly, I'd like to welcome into the live chat, Tom Colby, Zaga Nostra Nostra, Gonna Cry 96 Tears, Roland Tay, hey, good to see you. Corky Goss, Carla Hernandez, All the Sun, Michael Charlie, Piper Fogel, of course, Phoebe Ayape, Melissa Cliverda, um, and uh, G. Agrar, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, John Carroll, or Cord Brooks. These are two new names here. Welcome aboard. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as advertised, I have a, a repeat appearance of one James W. Lee, otherwise known as Jamie Lee. He's a longtime resident of California. Not only does he write about the real history of Alta, of California, right, the state of California, but he's a longtime resident as well. And uh, he lives in the beautiful county of Mendocino. And just very briefly, for those of you who have not come across his, his work, I know tens of thousands have, and we're gonna talk about how you can access his work before we finish this hour today. And speaking of this hour, I also wanted to make a quick uh, announcement that I will be with John O'Loughlin today at uh, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and that would be eight o'clock uh, uh, Eastern Time. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the fines uh, that concerned one Ghislaine Maxwell, and it goes far beyond Ghislaine Maxwell. The mainstream media as well as independent media is, is skewing it in a certain way, but, but there's much more important information behind the Maxwell intelligence web. So just to give you an idea of the prominence uh, that uh, Jamie Lee uh, maintains within the, uh, the true, what I call, some people call alternative, but the true research community, he's been, his work has been featured or he's been interviewed live and such, uh, uh, media outlets as Waking Times, Activist Post, to Reddit, before it's news.com. He's been with David Icke. Everybody knows Dave, the great David Icke. StopTheCrime.net. Alana Freeland. Wow, that's great. She, uh, Alana Freeland has a new book that's uh, just come out. I understand that. I'm going to be sure to order that. Rents.com, Natural News, Alex Jones Show, Sage of Key. And uh, he's even been featured in the 2015 Most Censored Stories, which is run out of, I think, Sonoma State University, a really great uh, institution in itself. So with that, let me turn it over. Let me bring in Jamie Lee. Man, I'm as excited as you all out there about what he's going to drop on us today because he sent me an advanced copy of, of this new book of his on the real California history, a PDF, and I've been looking at it and just my mind is just spinning, uh, just like a, like a top, like one of those anti-gravity machines, de Glocka, right? <laughs> so Jamie, come on, <laughs> where are you? Oh, uh, welcome, sir. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you having me on your show again. And um, this is the first time I've spoken on this topic after I just released my book, um, it's on my website, a plain truth info free. Um, I release my books free. It's also on Amazon and it's also um, um, going to be on um, uh, Kindle as well, because this is this is the story as we we're talking off camera before. Um, Daryl, is that this getting into this story as I grew up in California and I just started being curious. I mean, that's where you get a lot of information is just being curious. Why is this this? How did this happen? And I wrote the Tartarian book, which has sold over 4,000 copies about a culture that we never heard about until just a few years ago. And now it turns out there was this uh, one world civilization of benevolence and kindness and beauty and grace and love that existed with free energy everywhere. And you can read that in my Tartarian book. So that led me to look at the structures in San Francisco where I grew up in Marin County and across the bay in Marine, uh, the Marina Park, uh, Chrissy Field area, you may know on the western side of the San Francisco Bay, right by Treasure Island, there was a fair, an exhibition that happened in 1914, just six, nine years after uh, 1906 earthquake. So it's eight years after the 1906 earthquake. And that, um, that was a structure over 684 acres where the president of the United States came, the first long distance telephone system was used. They had planes flying inside the Henry Ford building that was manufacturing cars. There was Marines that were stationed outside on the ocean making fog so they could have fog at night. There was the town of Jules 
a tower that that is 47 stories tall with a thousand jewels in it. Um, and now we just see the Marina District. You just see the edifice of the Palace of Fine Arts and what was there, which was a reconstruction. Then it led me back to the 1893 exhibition in Gold, what was now Golden Gate Park, which had another huge uh, structures in it and, and back then. And then I got to go back to the 1850s. And here we get into the beginnings of what started my whole journey was wondering, first of all, um, what what happened to the brown skins? And I'm using the term brown skins deliberately because I've never met a black person before. I don't think any of you have once you think about this. Have you ever met a black person that's the color black? No, they're brown. They're shades of brown. And they used to be called up, in eight, up until 1828, Webster's Dictionary called them the Copperheads. And there was actually the Copperhead Party that was part of the Democratic Party that was usurped up by the Freemasons as I get into. So I started wondering about what happened 1846 to 1848 with the Mexican-American quote war. And then we had the California gold rush in 1849. And then you had California statehood in 1850. And I didn't really study that much in school, but I don't remember us teaching anything more than California was created in 1850. There was this bear frag revol revolt and that was it. Well, it turns out that we, the story goes, you know, about the San Francisco 49ers and the San Francisco 49ers celebrate the California gold rush when California in 19, 1849, when, when the uh, Marshall uh, at, at Sutter's Fort, where John Marshall discovered a flake of gold, a gentleman, a Freemason named Samuel Brennan, who just happened to bring a, a, a newspaper uh, machine to San Francisco in 1847, Freemason, was able to tell the news of the world about the California gold rush in 1848, February or January 24th, 1848 was when the flake was first found, so January. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because, okay, now they have to go back and tell everybody down in San Francisco, because there's only a few people there, about the news of the gold. And then they have to put it on a printing press and put it on a ship, because there's no communications in 1849. You have to sail a ship down to South America, down the Cape Horn, all the way back up to the East Coast, taking six to eight months to get the news that there's the gold rush. And then President Polk gets on TV in December of 1848 and says there's gold rush. And that starts the greatest migration in the history of the world, end quote, Wikipedia. So all of a sudden, thousands, tens of thousands. And by 1900, there's 1 1.2 million people in California when there was just a bunch of savages. Remember, the savages. That's what you hear the term, savages. <laughs> No, that was after General James Savage, who was such a savage, he killed more Indians than anybody, and they twisted it around and called it savages. 1850, statehood is declared by a gentleman named, no gentleman, a free, not a Freemason, Peter Burnett, first governor of California. And the first governor of California does the Indians Protection Act by giving $300 to any brown skin that's killed and proof of it, sometimes with a scalp and you got to take over their lands. Now there was 300,000 brown skins called Californios, Mexican Californios. Now we have a name for European Americans. We have a name for African Americans. We have a name for Chinese Americans, but we don't ever use the word Euro Americans. But the Euro white Americanos, I call them, and I differentiate the book between Euro whites, who was the Spanish 1492 when Columbus lands, third time he finally landed in America down in Mexico, right? And when he landed in Mexico, I showed the proof that, that he called it the land of paradise. It was Paradisimo Terrestria. It was the land of paradise because there was so much fecundity because here in Alta California, which goes all the way up to Canada and encompassed Nevada, Arizona, Washington, New Mexico, all of these lands were part of the Brownskins lands. And that's when they took it back from Spain in 1836 from the Spanish, uh, and, and then uh, it was called the Treaty of Huengo, Huenga. And then they appointed two governors to basically give out land grants. And all the problems started when the white guys started coming in from Texas and they started giving them land grants if they married uh, brown-skinned brown Californios. And so all the white 
guys, generals and guys married the women and they got the lands. And that's how they got the lands, except for two traitors to the Mexican people, uh, Pio Pico and uh, General Vallejo, which is Vallejo is named after. They joined the missions and did the missions work because the missions were all up and down California at the time. You had the San Rafael mission in, in, in 1766. You had the Presidio mission in. You had all these missions going up on the West. But in the middle, it was ruled by Queen Califia. And California was an island up until 1810. Yes, it was. And that's why the Great Salt Lake could not be traversed for the gold rush until 1840s. They couldn't get across it because the Great Salt Lake was still a lake and then it took a couple decades to dry out. And when you look at the Transcontinental Railroad, it was not put in until 1869. So here you have the gold rush in 1849 and you're having all them they can't get across yet. They have to come by, tra uh, by, uh, by ship. So there was over 700 ships said to come into San Francisco Harbor in 1850 and over 491, I believe, came in in 1849 from the East Coast for the gold rush. So all these ships are coming in, right? And now they drive, they come to San Francisco and there's a bunch of poor people because they're trying to get rich because literally you could find gold on the ground. Now they said John Marshall said he found a gold flake, excuse my French, but bullshit. There was 145 pound gold nuggets just sitting on top of the earth, just sitting there. That's what got everybody out here. There was silver mines, the great Comstock load. There was copper mines everywhere. They were mining copper like crazy. Do you know the first diamonds, Daryl, in the United States were found in Northern California? I did not know that. Where specifically? Let me tell you, Paradise, California. Ever heard of uh, the place? Well, of course, by now, yes. The second biggest nuggets in California was found in Paradise. And that's yeah. Bidwell, the Freemason. And Freemasons play out through all this. John Merriweather, who did the immigrant trail with Lewis, Freemasons. I put their lodges in, who they're with. Fremont, who's a city of named Fremont's named after him. Bad guy, really bad guy, murder, celebrated murder. Every and, and then you had Buffalo Bill who ran the trains when they got the Transcontinental Railroad and murdered 30 to 50 million buffalo. Every buffalo killed is a dead Indian, he said. Sponsored by the US government, who also sponsored the Mormon militia and the Mormon regiments that came to California and were there before the gold rush in 1849. They were already sending back gold to Salt Lake City in 1847 before the gold rush. Why? Because when the white guys got into California in the 1846, they found the Californios were already had gold, but they weren't using it because they never thought of taking things from the land. You can't own anything. This is Father Sky and Mother Earth. And they lived in fecundity and the beauty, which I get into at the beginning of the book, of the mass elk and the bears, they're all friendly. They needed no fences. Everything lived in fecundity and they only took what they needed. And they only lived in small tribes. So they couldn't, you know, round them up. So they had to bounty hunt them. And as I said, the U.S. government gave this bounty hunter. So here all these ships arrive in 1849. So the story goes, the California Gold Rush president announces it. And the story goes that the California shoreline of San Francisco Bay was created by the ships that were all scuttled when they came over and they went up to the Sierras to get the gold, right? So they're going to scuttle all these ships, the story goes, and that's what made San Francisco shoreline. So in the 1906 earthquake, they did more fill. So all that area. So the original shoreline, Daryl, did you know the original shoreline of San Francisco is the Transamerica building? I did not know that. I know there's a lot of landfill there in the marina area. All the way across, yeah. I mean, that's that's at least three, two, three miles inland. That was the original. I, I, put, I, I pour that in the book. So here the story goes, 1850, they sh everybody, including the boat captains, are running up to the Sierra Nevadas. Now, you're from California, and I am too, but most of us don't know. Most people don't think about it. But once you get to San Francisco, that's just half your problem. Now you got to get up to the Sierras. Okay, now you're sailing on these huge, massive clipper ships that bring all these trains, apparently, on their, on their, on their holds. They're bringing these 20-ton trains. There was hundreds of trains and the rail tracks and the grading and the engineers. And, the, you know, because 1852, they had trains in Sacramento running in 1852. Well, how are you going to get all this up to Sacramento when you have to get there by water? You've got the Yuba River, you've got the American River, you've got the Feather River and the Petaluma River. So well, you're going to have to go by boat. Well, here you get to San Francisco. Now you got to get up to the gold rush and you don't have a boat. Well, now you got to have a sloop or somebody to take you up to the gold fields that has to go all the way down around and up 
to get up to Sacramento and it took several days and boats capsized, but they didn't have any, any boats to get up there. So it was a real problem how just to get up there. Oh, but they had to add picks. They had to have shovels. They had to have horses. They had to have food. Everything when they came here, they needed. Well, it turns out the story goes one out of six Argonauts, they called them, prospectors that came on ship and by land, one out of six died within six months of arriving in California. Why? Because there was smallpox, there was cholera, there was all these diseases that were hitting the native brown people. Why? Because the Jesuits and the Freemasons gave them all blankets. Smallpox, blankets. Same thing going on that went on in the 1600s when Columbus came, went from 3 million population in South America down to almost eliminating them all. And then the Jesuits in the 1600s says, you either join our, merchant, our, our mission, convert or die. And that was the missions. You either work for them, brown skins, or you were dead. And they hunted them down. And that continued up until the Mexican War in 1848, when in 1846, there was 300,000 brown skins in California indigenous. And by 1852, 24,000. So 300,000 down to 24,000 in three years, over 100 or 79 tribes listed. There's more than that on the list, but 79 tribes down to zero. And then what General Vallejo did after he signed over at the Bear Frag Revolt in 1846 and raised the California flag in Sonoma Mission Inn and signed over California to General Fremont of the California Battalion to the U.S. government, they created the California Republic from 1846 to 1847. And then the military, because Vallejo and Fremont apparently were trying to take it over California themselves because Texas had just took over Texas independently. So they were trying to do it. Then the U.S. government came in with all their ships and said, no, 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 you're not going to do that. So 1850 became statehood. Uh, Vallejo ran for office and became one of the first senators. General Vallejo became one of the first senators. And he's also the one that, that, that was, um, the guy was all over the place. He was down in Monterey with the signing of the Constitution. But he was the guy generally that signed over all of California from the brown people to, to, the, to the white people. And that was the end of the natives' ownership, if you call it that, of the lands until 1850 when they created all these acts, they put taxes on any foreigners, they started calling them foreigners and they started calling them neophytes. And that's how they changed all the names, Daryl. They changed all the names to make it like, if, if I'm calling somebody from Mexico, I'm, I, what language they speak? Spanish. They don't speak Mexican, <laughs> right? And they call them Latin Americans. No, they're not, they're an original ancient ones. They were the first people here on these lands. These were their lands, and this is the big story. These were their lands until the white guys came over with 150 regiments and Mormon militia and California militia and wiped them all out within a few years and took over all their lands. And the very first thing Vallejo does when he gets into office the state of California, he remaps 27 counties, Marin, Sonoma, Napa, over the lands of the native people. And I don't use the word Indian because Indian is what Columbus called it. They're not Indians. They're not blacks. They're not Negroes. Those are all names I get into of what the definitions are. So what they did was they labeled over all the native people's tribes and whatnot, and they were forgotten. And that was the end. Like you talked about, the only was just one of the 79 tribes. So I'm bringing those back and I'm calling for, if, we're, if there's any justice in the world, these lands go back to the native people. It's their lands. And then uh, super apologies. So I get into the massacre, some of the massacres, like the Bloody Island Massacre up in Lake County. And this was just out and out slaughter. I mean, they were bounty hunting just as game. And like I said, they got land. The more land, the more people they killed, the more land they were given. So that's, that's my take on this all is that the reason the California gold rush was created was to hide the fact of these murders and genocides and massacres of the native people who were defenseless. They never fought anybody. They didn't need to because they lived in peace and harmony and they lived on an island. And that's why California's redwood trees are 3000 years old. That's why there's gold 140, 50 pounds just sitting on the surface of the earth because it was left alone by the natives. They didn't take and profit and capitalize and then when the waters receded, they actually took one tree was called the mammoth tree, a giant sequoia. 
30 feet wide. They took it apart and they shipped it to Chicago for the 1893 exhibition. Then they shipped it over to England and then they shipped it to Washington because no one had ever seen trees that big because California was left alone from the pillaging of the white man. And that's the last place they got to. And within five years, they had taken down all the redwoods, too. That's a whole other story I'm getting into my next book. 30, Just to interject, 40. those sequoias had been there since the time of Christ. Is that right? Like 2,000 years. 3,000 years. 3,000. There you go. 3,000. In fact, there's a tree out here in Fort Bragg. The first one, you know, the story goes, Cabrillo came around South America, landed in Drake's Bay. Drake comes in. I'm going to get into this whole thing on Marin County. Drake was another slave trader. Um, I mean, everything's named after these guys who were just complete, you know. So the redwoods here, but, but they were protected from fires and everything. And so they have a they have a, a stump they cut, one of the bigger trees in Fort Bragg out here on the coast. And it's laid on its side and it goes back to 1209. And they, are, and they show the time of Christ's birth and they show all the dates of the tree rings <laughs> with the different events over that time. And what precious. And here within two decades, the white man has come and decimated 97% of the native trees and used them for redwoods and board foot. But not only that, they had trains coming up and down Mendocino in 1854, 1856. They had redwoods being logged when all they had was handsaws. Can you tell me, Daryl, how you can handsaw a 30-foot tree, redwood tree? You can't. The tr the, the, if you do any type of sawing when you're using your chainsaws, it gets pinched. And then you got all the sap that goes in it, and they got two guys pulling back and forth, and that's a whole other BS story. They had advanced technology back then but they had never seen the kind of fecundity. And then also one other thing, Silicon Valley, the reason Silicon Valley was formed, and this is new news, but right below there is a place called New Albanen, Almaden, like the Almaden wines, mm -hmm. New Almaden. So that's right below San Jose, Silicon Valley. And that in the 1850s was the largest red mercury mine in the world. Now, red mercury they used to make an amalgam to tie to the gold when they'd run the gold down so they could break it apart and separate the gold from the dirt and whatnot. But the primary purpose of the red mercury was to use in the creation of free energy. So when you see the, all the towers with the capital domes and the bronze domes, and you see the magnets on top with the Wi-Fi, the thing that makes it is red mercury because it has a little attachment. The name of California Sea be, between California and Nevada before, before when it was an island was called the Red Sea because all the red leached out into the water there. And mercury, when it's benign, isn't a problem, but what combines it back down is methylmercury. And now still to this day in Santa Clara, in the Bay Area, still to this day, the water is so polluted from the methylmercury from these mines, you can't drink it. And then they buried the evidence as well, like up in Lake Shasta now, it's coming up now. There were four cities that were under Lake Shasta that were compromised, Kennett Mine and four other ones. These ghost towns that they literally flooded the people out on. I mean, they had saloons, they had they had all this stuff. They had Tiffany chandeliers and stuff. Under Folsom Lake was, was more. Under Lake Almonor was another city. Under Whiskey Town was another city. And literally in the 20s and 30s and the, and the great... Um, what was the FDR great projects, you know, the uh, build out projects of all the dams and stuff. They literally buried the cities underneath and forgot about them, except for the problem is the arsenic, cyanide, and all the leaching is still coming up through the water into our water systems today. Because this stuff does not stop its toxicity. Once this stuff gets into the systems, it just keeps leaching and leaching and leaching. And when they did the hydraulic mining, when there was only two years of the gold rush that anybody, low, loan prospectors, made money for the most part, for two years, okay? After that, it was corporate mining that took over. And they brought in the sluice, water sluice. They brought in the hydraulic cannons. They took apart the, the sides of the water. And they created such a problem in San Francisco Bay that it filled three to four feet of shoreline all across the Bay Area, all the way from Sacramento, from all the sluice. And, and, and stuff that poured down. So that closed off the Sacramento River. So it made it unnavigable for people to get up there to build, to bring the trains and get the lumber and build the railroads for the transcontinental river, railroads for the big four Freemasons, Stanford, Crocker, uh, Hopkins, and one other guy um, started the railroad system build out from, from California, Sacramento to connect 
1869 at Promontory Point in Utah from the east that Lincoln, Lincoln had authorized once they killed off all the buffalo and stuff from that side. And so um, Lincoln authorized the build of the trans transcontinental. But they said they got 20,000 Chinese to help them build it from the, from the east. And I'm thinking about how did they get 20,000 Chinese to the east coast? <laughs> You have to sail all the way around the other way just to get the Chinese to come in and work on the railroads. Where did they all come from? Then there was 30,000 Chinese that came out here, supposedly to California, that were treated like horrible slaves. As soon as they got here, the women were, were used and the men were taken for slaves. And they were then they were interned. I get in the book internment um, in Angel Island later. And then we know about the um, 1943 World War II internment of the Japanese. You know, this has been a constant onslaught on brown people of just the white guy saying, we're going to change the laws, we're going to raise the taxes, and we're going to do everything we can. But this story is about California and how it was founded on, on you know, I, I'm trying to use the word, not use the word genocide, but there's no other word to say it. And even, even Wikipedia, if you can look up the genocide of 1850 in Wikipedia, it lists 40 of the massacres. It lists them. So it's not like, oh, you're making this stuff up. You know, if Wikipedia says it, it's got to be true. No, but I did further research and a lot more books and stuff. And, and uh, The Only Way is a really good book on the Native history. And I've got other books that I'm reading on, on Natives that are coming out that used to be here. And I think bringing back to life their story and who they were and they were peaceful, loving, kind people. They had their ghost dances. They had their way they revered the land and they lived in peace with each other. It's a beautiful story. And the whole white man story is that they were savages. You know, they attacked. Well, tell me something. All these white guys come here with Gatling guns, with swords, with horses, with massive ships and everything. And you can defend yourself with bows and arrows. And they start killing off all your people and raping your women and taking your children away. Do you think you're going to strike back? Do you think you're going to try and stop them? Well, as soon as you do this, oh, look, at the, they released our horses or they killed one of our guys. So they made it sound like the natives were bad people. <laughs> when in fact, all they had was stones and arrows to defend themselves against the white man's powerful machines and they were no match. Oh, so. Now, Jamie, before we went on air, you were talking about these official repositories of knowledge, of historical knowledge, the libraries like the Bancroft. And this is where all the most of the scholars keep drawing their their primary resource material from. What's your take on these like places like the Huntington Library down in at Los Angeles County or the Bancroft, which is housed at the University of California? Can you bring up that screen that uh, can I screen oh, yeah. share? Uh -huh. Do you have that up still or should I? I will this bring way? it up. Whoops. Where is it? Hmm. Is it there or should I bring it up again? Uh, yeah, you'll have to bring it up so I can put it on there. Okay, let me get this up here. Um, share. All right, it says I'm sharing now. Do you? Oh, uh, no, it's gone. Yeah, that. How about that one? Can you see my screen? No, I can only see you. Let me try and share this real quick. It was out there before. Let's share. Yeah, I'm really interested. Yeah, I mean, it, I skipped to the uh, chapter 12 where you talk about these buried cities. Now, what was the incentive of the political establishment for burying, quote unquote, their own people, like underwater, whatever it might be? Kennett, California, you mentioned, and just to hide evidence or uh, to get rid of the, the 49ers or what was it? Was it like the the fires that you wrote about recently? Um, yes, all of the above, I guess. I mean, <laughs> it just, it just, you know, they needed water reservoirs because they had taken the waterways um, and polluted them so, and so they needed to save good water. This is me just theorizing, okay? Mm -hmm. um, that I wish I could show you in this buried cities, buried evidence, but um, it wasn't just the cities I named. There was Kennett. I mean, listen to Kennett. Kennett had 40 saloons, dozen of trade stores, a hotel, hospital, schoolhouse, opera house, and now it's sitting at the bottom of Lake Shasta, 400 feet below. 
Um, the Eagle's mine had 117 million pounds of copper. It's under Shasta Lake as well. Um, two huge copper mines. I mean, again, copper was used for free electricity. That's what they don't want. They don't want to advertise it. They also found iron ore. They found titanium. Uh, Whiskey Town in 1962, uh, two weeks before uh, Kennedy was assassinated, he did a dedication on Whiskey Town once they filled it up on how they buried the city of a of, of, of former gold mine. Folsom Lake, there was a place called Negro Hill, which they buried, which was where all the all the brown skins established their gold area, where they call them Negroes, they changed the name. Lake Berryessa was another one buried. Um, it had, in 1950, it had a hotel, a general store, a restaurant, two pumps and a cemetery. 300 people lived there. Lake Almador was called Big Meadows, the Northern Madu tribes, the new settlers was taken over. Bidwell Bar, that's up in um, paradise there. Had a post office in 1853. Why are they having post offices in 1853 when the Pony Express didn't go to late 70s, 1880s? I mean, it doesn't make any sense why they had all these post offices in. Uh, Lexington and Almonton Lakes, there's cities under the, uh, their towns under there, Comanche, Poverty Bar, Lancha, Malonis, Millertown, Lake Isabella. All these have cities buried underneath. Silverwood Lake, Cedar Springs, Lake, <laughs> Lake McClure. Bagby, Searsville. So yeah, so I list all these lakes and get into a little bit of their history um, about what happened to them and, you know, bearing the evidence and then putting them underwater. And now with the, with the drought going on, we're seeing some of these uh, buildings starting to come back up again, which is, which is pretty amazing. Now, Jamie, can I ask you to speculate on this? Uh, I know it's not in your book, but uh, what is the relationship of the Nas U.S. National Park System? You already touched on the giant sequoias, the California sequoias. But what, what was uh, uh, the, the vision behind, let's say, John Muir, for example, and this whole building of the national and, and Teddy Roosevelt, the U.S. National Park uh, System? And how does that relate to the current research? Because I like to try to make connections between two seemingly unrelated areas of endeavor. How might that connect to the work of David Paulides, who talks about these missing persons in U.S. national parks? They're inexplicable scenarios that, that he has documented, has reported on. Is there a connection there, do you think? Yeah, definitely. And um, let me see if I can bring it up here. Um, and these places that you mentioned, these are also rife with a lot of uh, accounts, reports of what might be called crypto terrestrials, cryptids, these different uh, types of creatures that are not officially recognized by the zoological community, otherwise known as, for example, Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Right. right? right. How, how well, does no, that I mean, with your research? <laughs> okay, you got a lot of stuff going on here. And I want to get okay. back to Bancroft too. Um, all, right. all right. So um, I'm just going to read, since I can't bring this up a little bit, Yosemite. How was Yosemite founded? The Mariposa, quote, Indian War was the most famed massacre of natives with miners in Southern Sierra region of Central California. In 1849, whiteies invaded a uh, country immediately west of Yosemite Park. Um, and, and if you take the word Yosemite, you put yo and then put a dash, you got yo semi. Get that? Huh. Gold was easy to found, numerous mountain streams, so the natives had to be removed so the new settlers could make their fortunes because they were already had the gold. The native brown skins, mostly Monu Piots, welcomed the white man and the goods, which could be obtained by trade. To a certain extent, the story of the clash was between um, the natives and the Euros whites, James D. Savage, Savage Indians, who was said to be one of the most remarkable of the gold rush. Tall man, a bear flagger, a one-time Sutter employee, uh, reported to left San Francisco by holding gold dust through the ho hotel lobby. Um, Savage quickly learned most of the native tongues, integrated himself by taking many wives from the tribes. One said he had 33. And we learned about uprising in 1850. Um, he appealed to the governor, but he didn't respond. So um, Savage was running the Mariposa Battalion with three companies led by John Kuykendall, Captain Boiling, and Captain Dill. They went southward um, while the other two companies tracked and pursued the fleeing natives up the mountains. Genocide plans for the brown skins while a federal Indian commission was formed to authorize the killings. On March 1851, signed a treaty with six tribes. 
The other tribes that didn't sign it, the Miwoks, the Chowchillas, the Yokoats were absent. So Savage went up and killed all of them. The battalion was forced to march three to five feet in snowdrifts and rain and sleet a few found natives. The second campaign, April 13th against the Chowchillas, destroyed the Mexican California food stores. But again, the natives were able to elude the pursuers. The death of their chief induced the Chowchillas to surrender and accept reservation status. When the Yosemites refused to come to Camp Berber and make peace, the third campaign was launched against them, but no more success than the others. Um, they were captured at Lake Tanaya on May 22nd. Uh, they were forced to accept race reservation life for the rest of their lives. In 1851, San Diego County unilaterally imposed property taxes on native Mexican American tribes in the county and threatened to confiscate land and property should they fail to pay up to the $600 tax. The new obligations for taxes applied to Cupino and the Cumayo, who hardly dealt with any U.S. currency. So that was the Yuma Wars, 1850. So that's Yosemite. So what they did is once they took all the lands or it became too polluted, they just made national state parks out of them um, oh. to answer that, that question. is Again, hiding the evidence, changing the story, not allowing access. A lot of these mines that are no longer these copper mines, actually there's a copper mine out here in um, out here in um, um, uh, Mendocino um, that are they're not even marked anymore. They don't even they don't even recognize them. They don't even mark them anymore. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's um, kind of like but, the uh, experimentation for nuclear weapons uh, down in the desert. Uh, it's the same site where they were holding um, Burning Man. So all the people that were there celebrating right. were were being irradiated by the right. visual. Grounded. And that's why they call it the Black Desert. Yeah, that's that's where the natives won't go. It's the Black Desert. That's why they won't go there. And of course, they're putting Burning Man on top of that. That's that's the Jesuit motto. Let's set the world on fire. So you asked me about George Bancroft, and he's the he's the guy, as you well know, Daryl, that run that is the whole history of California at Berkeley, Bancroft Library, a big phallic uh, tower right next to it. Um, he was provided with an inventory of books to be selling. Apparently, he became a serious collector in 1852. So here you are in California. You just get off a ship. There's nobody here but a bunch of brown skins. Everything's getting set up, and you're becoming a serious book collector with thousands, tens of thousands of volumes. Excuse me? How does that happen? So he says by 1900, he had 45,000 books. It was moved in 1881 to a fireproof booning, and by 1900, Bancroft Library had 45,000. In 1886, the published establishment of A.L. Bancroft burned, and the sheets of seven volumes of history had to be rewritten. Hey! He developed a plan to publish a history of 39 volumes the entire Pacific Coast region of North America, Central America, to Alaska. Though he never graduated from college, he was given an honorary Master of Arts degree from Skull and Bones, Yale, and in recognition of his massive historical work on the native races of the Pacific states. Gee. Now, was Bancroft ever cited at the famous uh, Bohemian Grove nearby? No, but I just found something very interesting on my next book about Bohemian Grove, which is up here in Santa Rosa, which was founded in 1871. And the railroad went from, from Sausalito to Bohemian Grove in 1870. How about that? But the Bohemian Grove was actually founded, uh, was actually originally established at the base of Mount Tam at Muir Woods. That was something new I just found out. Hmm, okay. They first set it up in Muir Woods, and that's that's where FDR came to commemorate the signing of the United Nations um, in 1840, 1946, 45, whatever it was. And that's um, where John Muir comes in, who was a famous exterminationist himself, was he not? John, John you Muir? You know, I haven't. You know, I'm going to look into him now that you said that. And I always just do whatever name I put up. I either put up a name and a Jesuit or a name and Freemason. And generally, if they're Freemasons, they love to advertise. But I don't remember John Muir coming up, but the rest of the gang, you know, all those players that founded California. Why is San Francisco named San Francisco? It used to be named Yerba Buena until mm -hmm. 1847. And then they changed the name Yerba Buena, which means good herb. St. Francis, San Francisco. And there's a book called Jesuit, uh, Jesuits in the Golden Gate, 1849. They're telling you by 1849, there's a big 300-page book telling you how we were already here. And all the churches, Grace Cathedral, and all these buildings. And then there's this other guy, Donahue. 
he's a piece of work, another Freemason. He built the railroads out. He started the first uh, gas and electric company. He built the trains. He had the ironworks foundry. He had all these things going on. Yet he arrived in, in California absolutely broke. And within three years, he's got a foundry. He's making trains. He's making boats. <laughs> I mean, he's running the PG&E. He's doing this. He's doing that. And then you got the Mormon guy, um, um, Donahue, who brought the press over, the printing press in 1847 to announce the gold rush. He's a Mormon that came over on a ship called the Portsmouth, and he organized a bunch of Mormons to come over. And um, all of a sudden, they were here. He was doing everything, too. He was, he was running trains. He was running ships. He was selling this. He was selling gold. He was selling uh, 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 um, shovels. He was uh, all the stuff you needed to get up. I mean, there's just all there's this Fremont. There's Donahue. Um, there's just a few key players that everything builds off of. Mm -hmm. And once you see the absolute volume of what they said these guys do, it's absolutely proof that no way. There's no way they could have brought this many. I mean, and think about Jamie, this. Jamie, I think you I have think stumbled you upon a new way of looking at history. Let's, let's, let's call it let's the Schmendrick theory of history. <laughs> Because you have like your Jeffrey Epstein's or a Schmendrick's. So you have these guys you just listed in, in the latter part of the 19th century. They're yep. Schmendrick's, they're schlubs. Yep. And all of a sudden, they're owners of all this vast array of resources. But I think you yep. touched upon maybe they're front men for, play, for these entities like Skull and Bones, the Eastern um, and the City of London banker establishment. It's a Schmendrick theory of history. Well, it's the religion. I mean, if they came over and said convert or die. And they still had they still had uh, sterilizing programs going up until the 1930s on brown skins. That was still part of it going on, and they still do them in prisons. They had to make laws just recently to stop sterilizing women in prisons. This isn't this isn't anything new. We're not we're not you know we're not. Now, um, Jamie, I have to ask this: as you were speaking, you were hinting at certain secret technologies, advanced technologies like sawing down those giant sequoias right how with those primitive hand saws no can and also the uh, extraction and the free energy systems it seems like we're we're already starting to evolve in the mid 19th century it's not this is not new so how do you think that knowledge that you have uncovered complements our current discoveries about secret space programs, for example, and why are these places like Vandenberg and all these other uh, secret space installations, that they seem to follow that missionary pattern as well. They're built on old sites like that or native, native, uh, former native reservations, so-called. How does that fit in there? Is there a continuity of the historical uh, process there between late late uh, middle to late 19th century and going into 21st century secret space technology and the great reset now we're being sold that we're going through another period of prosperity right that's how it was sold to the people in the 19th century or it's just the opposite we're going into a new dark ages of uh serfdom and, and mass uh, annihilation in, in the guise of progress can you comment on that Sure. And just as someone who's commenting, Grace Cathedral was built in 1960. No, please look in your research. The original one was, I believe, um, 1856 or 57. No, they had the churches in there. No, this is this is a religious war, and we're still at it today. Um, if you read the history of the genocide, um, half the genocide that occurred was through vaccines and plagues that the white man brought over. And that's admitted. You know, you had the Holocaust, the plagues coming in. And this is from the 1500s. They had vaccines, folks. And they said the first vaccines came down on a Russian ship. Did you know there was a Russian America company in 1830? The Russian American Corporation that founded Fort Ross that was allegedly brought the first vaccines over? Well, think about it. How did they form a corporation in 1830? What did they call up? Hey, Vladimir, let's form a corporation. Come on, buddy. <laughs> that doesn't happen like that, folks, if there's no communications. So in my book on the Tartarians, I get into the history of or her story of that technology has been around. We've just been turned off to it. Remember, we said Tesla founded free energy in 1905. No, that's just to hide the Tartarians had free energy anywhere. Google Stargate, Starforts. If you look at Starforts, there's hundreds and hundreds of Starforts all around the world that were energy centers. All the cathedrals, Notre Dame, Grace Cathedral, all these with the pointed domes and the towers, those are Wi-Fi centers. 
free energy centers. They put they put copper on the domes, okay? They put magnets on the side, and then they put the, the free mercury, the, the uh, red mercury, which moves very easily, and that creates the alternating current to make the energy, and it's free energy for everybody. And that they was destroyed. extracted down in Almaden by Almaden. San Jose, right? Is that what you yep. said? And the red mercury was used, and that's why you don't hear about red mercury. And if you look on Wikipedia, they're talking about, oh, the red mercury. Oh, that was used by the Russians. They were going to make a super bomb with it. And it's all a bullshit story about the red mercury and everything. You know, that's how you know when, when you know, it's like flat earth, when they don't want to tell you about it. You know, it's just something you got to know. But mm -hmm. all these stories about this mass radiation uh, I'm calling BS on that. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, no cancer. Come on, folks. Who owned the ports in, 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 in Nagasaki and Hiroshima during World War II? The Jesuits. Who carpet bombed, you know, General LeMay, bomb them all LeMay. The technology has been hidden from us for this moment in time. They've dumbed us down from the technology, got rid of the original Tartarians, who were brown skins, who were the Moors. There's, there, I get into my book like Lebanon, there's 60 cities I'm guessing I'm, I'm not accurate on these numbers, but I'd have to look it up. 60 cities named Lebanon in the United States, mm -hmm. 50 cities named Nazareth, Bethlehem, Zion, Rome. Why are there so many cities named like that? Because the ancient ones were here first. The slave trade of the brown skins went west to east. The knowledge of the world went from the west to the east. Mexico, and as I get into my book and I'm going to cover later, was the original Jerusalem. Puta was Utah, Zion, Moab. Why are all the names in Utah with all Zionist Israeli names? I cover in my book going down after the great flood of 1810, the Grand Canyon was now a Grand Canyon. And what did it expose now? It's exposing all these 40, 50 foot Buddha statues and all these different artifacts from Egypt that the Smithsonian Institute found in 1910 and then made the whole area, this area in Grand Canyon off limits. You can't go there. Is it a Why? national park by any chance? Yes, it's a <laughs> national park. And because the caves are dangerous, you can't go in there. But now there's enough articles coming out showing that all of these areas had European names because we were the original ancient ones, the brown people, not the whites. The browns were the original ancient ones, a land of, of paradise, and it was left alone. And so the directed energy was then brought to California, used on us after they used them on people in New York when they, they had a quarter million children on foundling trains, were sent to the Midwest, white ones, Irish, coming to the West. They were selling children to the, giving them away to the Midwest because they were getting rid of the parents and putting them in all these massive insane asylums. And they're doing that again to us, but they're doing it through technology. That's why they that, call this the- That's the, reminiscent of the Clinton Foundation, isn't it? What they're well, doing, I mean, the, the importation of children, the supposed orphans into the US and placing them with families and, and then destroying the the organic family. Well, yeah, and that's that's part of their their stated agenda was to break up the families and stuff. But this this whole children trafficking thing is such a much bigger story than very few people know. And when you get into that, I, I did a three hour documentary called um, "Touchless Torture Target Humanity" and how they how these ladies, um, uh, what are their names, uh, Kathy O'Brien and Arizona Wilder, and I'll think of the other one in a minute. But they wrote books like "Thanks for the Memories." Um, and, and they were torture victims and they wrote about what happened to them, how they were tortured and used as sex slaves for the presidents. And so all the presidents are compromised. They're all owned. They're all puppets and they use sexual predatory. Yeah, there you go. Here's another name to add to it. Her name is Marilyn Van Deber. And you remember Burt Parks, right? Sure. Miss America competition. She yep. was a former Miss America. So here's another person to add to the Kathy O'Brien, uh, what, Arizona Wilder, is that her name? Other people that have testified yep. to the similar process that they were subjected to. Right. And so they talk about that. And this was technology 40, 50 years ago. And they use USC. They use Boston University to develop the technology. This is what they do, like on the bioweapon stuff. They use universities for their proving and testing grounds. And the students don't know what they're working on. And then they'll bring it up and they'll use them to slave trade children, which they're doing now. I mean, they're doing phone apps for to track us and all this stuff, but they can't use phone apps to track predators. And this old Ghislaine Maxwell, do you know who her father is? Her father is the head media mogul of the world, folks. Hello. You don't think this information is getting out on purpose right as soon as they're bringing out the next variant, you know. 
So mm -hmm. it's all by design. It's all theater. But unfortunately, underneath that, there's some real ugliness that needs to come to light. And I know I'm going to get a lot of grief of speaking out against the white person, but we don't speak out against the Euro whites. I mean, when Trump says make America great again, that is an insult to the South Americans, the Central Americans and the Canadians. Aren't they America too? And the big question that started me on this whole journey, Daryl, was what was America before it was Central, South and North America? What was it? It was beautiful, it was fecundant, it was love, and we can go back there again. But we have to do it in tribes. We have to get on this, off this electronic system. We have to get away from, we have to go back to our food sources. We have to go back to our communities. And we have to start looking each other in the eye. Because the only way this is going to work going forward is if we can look each other in the eye and make agreements, treaties, pacts, those kind of things. I, no, no, no government. Govern means to rule, meant means mind. No mind control is going to own my ass anymore. I'll play the game if I have to, whatever, but I am never going to play in the arena, but I'm going to create something better than what exists today. And now we have blueprints going back to where they lived in peace and harmony forever. In time memorial, these brown people lived. And so, yeah, we can learn a lot, and then we can say we're so sorry, and then we can show retribution. I mean, Governor Newsom got on 2019 and apologized. We're so, so sorry for killing off all you people and taking all your lands. Then he threw a few million bucks at it and said, good. And what are they doing up in Canada? They're having indigenous day up in Canada up there where they say, hey, we murdered all you children and put you all in schools and took away your languages and your cultures. So sorry, here's some money. And that's it, that's it. So yeah, this is hopefully a wake up call and some people will keep investigating and we'll dig further and bring more of this to the surface. But last leave it here mm -hmm. is, is that when the original California was founded according to Turtle Island, which Calif North America was originally called Turtle Island. The earth was brought up by the turtle by a bird. I forget the name of the bird that brought the turtle up. And the very first thing that came up to the surface was the nipple of the breast of the woman. And that was California Island. And then everything else formed around there. So California was the original ancient ones, the original first of the first. And that's what they've been trying to hide on a big scale because California was so fecundant and beautiful and they, and, it had <laughs> I want it, I'm going to take it. So that that's that's the story I've come up with. Now, Jamie, now, Jamie let's say there's a move afoot to uh, reestablish uh, re the, the sovereignty of a native of peoples native or First people Nation or, or brown people, as you call them. How can, how can uh, those of us who them? are interlopers or latecomers to this, how, how can we perhaps benefit by this re- visioning of, of uh, human history in North America, South America. Can that be like the basis of a, of a, a restoration, let's say, of our humanity as opposed to uh, a mass extinction event that we're heading towards? Is that <laughs> what you're heading or suggesting perhaps? Well, to quote someone you all know, I have a dream. <laughs> and the dream is that we in, Me in Mendocino County, as I think I referred to on the, on the show uh, a time before, um, we passed a law, legal law, that gives Mendocino County power over state and federal law and community bill of rights and nature's rights to exist law. So nature can have standing in court. Mm -hmm. So my dream is to bring this, I'm gonna write this book also in Mexican, not Spanish, I'm gonna write it in Mexican. And I'm gonna bring it out to the Mexican people and let them see that they're not immigrants. They're not illegals. This was their land. Uh, my ranch manager here, I'm showing him Michicon, and that's where Columbus landed. And it's just like, Juan, you're the native people. Your people are the ones that started it all. You guys are like the best of the best, you know? And he's like, what? So he started reading my book and he's just showing me, and he goes, wow, I didn't know any of this. And you know, like Mexico was taken over when nine, nine, uh, nine teenagers, nine heroes tried to stop the Spanish invaders or the Mexican or the US invaders that went down to Mexico to take over Mexico, you know? The whole story is baloney. Well, they've taken down Columbus's statue down in Mexico City and they put up one of Queen Califia. So they're mm -hmm. honoring the woman again. And the feminine divine has to come to the forefront and we have to start writing our own rules. Mm -hmm. Don't call them laws. Regulations, our own words, our own systems, and right. do it in a way that declares our self-sovereignty. You don't own me. You never will. Mm -hmm. 
And for those who are skeptical that independent research such that Jamie Lee is doing and, and many others, I see Marty Farrell's here. He's related to Joseph P. Farrell. There, there's tons of people. And, and, and Jamie has been on many of these people's shows, people like David Icke. For those of you who, who think that you can't put the back in the horse, I'm reading this comment here, like it's, it's a done deal. We're never going to be able to recover from this. Let me just uh, illustrate a, a, a recent one with uh, Triumph that I came across the other day. Remember Sirhan Bishara Sirhan, who was in prison for over 40 years for supposedly being the assassin of the beloved Robert F. Kennedy, right, who was on the way to becoming president? Well, thanks to independent journalists, people of the ilk of Jamie Lee, they're not so reviled anymore. I think uh, we are gaining greater credibility and traction because we, we're, we're seeing through the lies that we've been fed. That's the general public. Well, he was given parole finally, uh, something like two months ago. And it's thanks to people like independent journalists like Lisa Peace, P-E-A-S-E. -E, it's called A Lie to Big Fail. She never gave up on the story. Tons of people have never given up on the story. They've, uh, they're still convening at the uh, COPA conference, whatever you may feel about them, the, the JFK community and, 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 and related. Uh, is really secondary to the fact that, that the truth needs to be pursued and it does pay off. It does result in substantive change. That's not going to happen like at the end of a uh, four-quarter basketball game or at the end of nine innings as Americans were kind of used to a quick payoff. It could take generations, but we got to put in the work that, uh, that people like Jamie Lee are doing uh, day in and day out. Your response to the parole not parole but the release of sirhan bishada uh sirhan jamie are you with us uh, you cut out for a sec was there a question there yes yeah i can what's hear you now response you cut out for the, a minute what's your response to the triumph of independent uh researchers in the case of the assassination of robert f kennedy his assassin sirhan sirhan was released from prison after serving <laughs> decades in prison they finally a jury a parole board actually finally said okay we have to listen to these independent researchers because it wasn't the the official historians that brought it to light it were the people who were on the periphery of that who are now i'm i'm seeing gaining more credibility and standing within the, amongst the larger public because I think the larger public is being real is realizing that our history that we learned through K to 12 kindergarten and 12th grade and through the university has mostly been bunk right well not um, it's been programming yeah and I get into that the history of, of California education when the Rockefellers bought up all the NGOs and started all the public textbook companies the uh, Wharton and, and, and Columbia, and they started the programming way back then. We can't understand how long this program has been going on to our minds. And so Sirhan Sirhan, he was a mind controlled victim who was used as a Manchurian candidate. Watch the Frank Sinatra movie. They had it way back then. You know, in the JFK, you think he was shot by a lone gunman. You think again, you think there were six people in the car. No, there was four people in the car. Yet all the, all the Googles now, and I've noticed this when doing my research, Google is censoring so much information. Many of my links that I had to go back to were no longer at Google now. When I had right. saved them for my, my book, they had, they had gone. I had to go to DuckDuckGo because they're literally eliminating information. And so how many people were in the JFK car, Daryl? You said four. How many do you know? Oh, I can't remember. All I remember is uh, Jackie heading up, you know, trying to exit the stage. Right. And she wore the same outfit, the pink outfit with the blood on it when Johnson was signed over as president. But there yeah. was I went to I went to Dallas. I went and studied that and I hired docents and went the whole thing about the story of the whole Texas thing with JFK. And the guys they asked for in the car, their continental suicide. I used to try. I, my buddy had one. These four suicide doors, you know, these two doors and suicide. Now, if you look on Google, they're all six. And here's what's really trippy. Six people, they say, are now Conley and his wife and another Secret Service man. So now there's six in the car and there's this big windshield in the middle of it, right? Mm -hmm. So I put in my book, my uh, uh, Flat Earth book, I put a picture because there was a painting in the Vatican of Kennedy slumping over after being shot because Cardinal Spellman ordered the hit. 
on Kennedy because he was going to bring up the dollar and get out of Vietnam and all that. And so he ordered the hit on him. And I know I had in the painting four in the painting. I go to my book and I look after I see this Mandela effect thing and there's six in the book. They were able to change either my mind or they were able to change the book. This is another story for another time, but this is CERN. This is mind control. So getting things mm -hmm. out now, seeding the record yeah. is critical. It's critical. We And buy books, folks, because Kindle is about burning. Yes. Get the hard copies. Get the CDs. Don't get the streaming uh, package. Get the hard resources right there. You mentioned, Jamie, as we close out here, the Mandela effect. Wow, what a psyop. Right. That's all we hear about in the mainstream media that, oh, yeah, uh, you you misremembered Cur Curious George or right? or now he's by Curious George, I guess. Right. Because we're, right. we're in a different agenda that, uh, that's being promoted. Yeah. The history is being not just rewritten, but reimagined and reconceptualized. I think that's part like of what the Beatles another, was about. Huh? It's another great reset. This is the another yeah. next great reset after the Tartarian reset of, of, of the uh, 1850s to 1920s. This is the next great reset where all this information, there's not going to be no vaccine wars. There's going to be none of this memory of anything ever happening. With the technology uh -huh. they have today, they can erase everybody's memories. They can erase everything people think and everybody thinks no. And then if you want to watch one last thing is this movie called Fahrenheit 451 where Benjamin Franklin is the first fireman and the firemen use torches to burn books. And why do you think they call it Kindle? Kindle is because they're burning books, folks. They're going to get rid of books. So Ray please. Ray Bradbury. Ray Bradbury, yeah. He called it way back when. And Isaac Asimov and the rest of these, you know, all right there are telling us. So the more we can preserve history, we, we sometimes we can't change what's going on, but we can be the observers and the witnesses and the recorders of what's going on for future generations. And we will be telling the story that others have long forgotten. And that's why we're doing what we're doing now. It's not for now, it's to seed the Akashic record for all things that have always been, and that we can help others understand down the road so they can figure it out a little better than we have. Because we've been, well, what do you call it? We've been schmaltzed. <laughs> <laughs> we've that's been schmaltzed by a bunch of intellectual schmendricks. Yep. James W. <laughs> Lee, let's end on that high note. You are you are living that that definition there, preserving it and extending it and capturing it. And ladies and gentlemen, get those books, get the ones on the Tartarian uh, Empire. They all go together. They all kind of articulate together. They fit in nicely together. One more time, James, how do you find your work? What's the best? I know we, we're with the retailer that ate the world, right? But Right. Well, oh, I'm wow. sorry, but you know, it's a double-edged sword. And okay. and so uh, if you go on Amazon under James W. Lee books, you'll get my books highlighted on there. If you go on a plain P L A N E truth dot info website, all my books are free on the website. Please share wow. it with all because this is this is knowledge. And and again, I, I throw out the book and I'm trying new stuff, and I'll get ripped a new, you know, if I'm wrong. You know, and but that's not happening. So it's telling me that I'm onto something when when I'm not getting a, hey, you know, this is wrong. And, you know, somebody said, well, this date is this or that date is that. So, again, this is just throwing it out there and then seeing what what we learn and then how the, the truth community takes it and builds from here. The ripple out from here should be huge because this is a story that not as just California. This is a world story that needs to get out from the yeah. Euro Americanos. <laughs> Thank you again, Thank you, James. James. I'm going to end the broadcast, end the broadcast and, and hang on for hang on a couple for seconds so I can say goodbye to you properly. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us in the live stream. Please share this video. It's a really important one. And it's the first interview uh, with the, the new book that Jamie has out here. So we're very proud of that. Thank you very much for joining us. Goodbye.